All right, so tonight our we have lesson number nine in our fall semester. We're talking about learning to use the right understanding that God gives to us. We're continuing in our theme of First Chronicles 1232, becoming men and women who understand. That's why we need to learn to use understanding. Become men and women who understand the times with knowledge of what Israel and the church should do. So our question is about what about the second coming? And how do these things fit into the second coming? So, <clears throat> the fear of God, the things we're teaching, uh, I'm teaching about the fear of God and becoming men and women who understand the times. How does this fit in with the second coming? So this is really a good a good opportunity for us to see how much of understanding uh, we're understanding and are we willing to grow in in understanding because it's going to it's going to push us in, in our if we're going to have God's understanding, it's going to push us. It's going to force us to grow. It's going to force us to continue to learn. It's going to force us to change some things that we have believed maybe for all our life, but they just, they're not true. So we go, I'm going to start back with our three questions. Does God exist? And I think all of us participating tonight would say yes. Number two, is the Bible true? That's the hardest question. Is Jesus Lord? Because if the Bible is true, it's going to force us to have a confrontation confrontation between what the Bible says and what our culture will say. Now, under these three questions, which everything I preach, everything I teach, falls under the category of these three questions, but there's three more things that we have to think, that we have to learn to recognize the difference in. Number one, commandments of God. Now, I'm using the word here, commandments, in a broad sense to be anything that comes under, thus saith the Lord. So it's more than just the Ten Commandments, but it is the, the words of God that are eternally true. Um, then we have what our culture tells us is right or wrong. And then we have personal convictions. Okay. I believe in practice, we can always preach and teach the commandments, thus says the Lord, <clears throat> with confidence. This is the word of God. It never changes. If we're in America or if we're in Russia, if we're in St. Kitts, if we were in Africa, South America, China, wherever you might go, these things never change. Then we have what our culture thinks, believes, and practices as right. We should never preach or teach about culture. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. We're going to get into this in just a second a little deeper. 
but I want us to think about cultural Christianity and cultural Jewish religion. What this is, is when Christianity or the Jewish religion, because both did the, have done the same thing, we bring into the pure biblical religion cultural things. We should never preach or teach about that. In fact, culture, I'm sorry, Christianity, true followers of Christ, should change the culture. Culture should not change the church. And a lot of what's going on in churches today uh, is the churches are wholeheartedly embracing culture and using the culture to, to change what has, what to change things, it's the standard, instead of allowing the Bible to be the standard. Convictions, convictions are what we hold personally. For example, so personal things that God has revealed to us as things that you must do. They, these things are right and wrong for you. For example, when I was uh, 16, God told me that I must be a preacher. He didn't say everybody's supposed to be a preacher. He said I had to. Number two, shortly thereafter, God revealed to me that I must marry Elise. Now, that's a personal conviction. Not everybody's supposed to marry her. I was. God told me I must be a missionary. These are personal convictions that God gave to me that I have to do. Now, concerning the second coming, I myself am personally what they call a premillennialist. I cannot ever remember preaching about this. From time to time, when answering questions from my students, I have outlined the three main thoughts on the second coming. We have post-millennial, which means that Christ will come back after the world gets better and better for a thousand years. Then we have premillennial, which is the most common form now. And we have amillennial. The amillennialists believe that Jesus will come back, but there will be no millennium reign of Christ. Uh, historically speaking, the post-millennial view was the most widely accepted. In the 1800s, early 1900s, you could hardly find anyone who was not post-millennial. If you look at the changes that occurred in mankind during that time, we had the interview, we invented antibiotics, we had steam power, the internal combustion engine, automobiles, electrification of, of, of the masses. Uh, the world was just making leaps and bounds, progress, 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 airplanes, all of these things. But then first well, First World War came along. This caused a serious problem for the post for the yeah, post millennials because if the world's getting better and better and Jesus is fixing to come back, how can we have World War I? Because it was a horrible, horrible thing. Millions of people died. So they sort of got over that. Then bam, the Second World War, and it completely destroyed all of those who believed in post-millennial. Then pre-millennial, and then the amillennial. Now, there is a difference between the commandments, thus saith the Lord, and historically settled doctrines. Now, when I speak about historically settled doctrines, I don't... I'm not saying that people have not backslidden away from them, but essentially these things have been 
uh, historically settled since the, the early church. For example, creator God. Now here lately we want to say God's maybe not creator, but historically the church has held to that. Holy God, uh, teachings about sin, salvation, Christ, the sacrificial death, these things, the doctrine and the teachings of the church, historically from the time of the book of Acts till now, have not changed very, very much. Well, when we talk about the second coming, this is not something that has been historically settled. Now, when we talk about the, pre, the premillennial view, we're talking about some of the things that people talk about or the falling away of the church, many false teachers. Uh, they talk about the rebuilding of the temple. And all of these things are listed as part of the requirements for things that will happen before Jesus comes back. But Romans chapter 11, we have one of these areas where it's God's word, it's unchanging, but people don't pay very much attention to it. In fact, I have never heard anyone speak on the second coming of Christ who has ever mentioned this requirement. Uh, when, when I first became pastor at Denton Valley, we had a, a deacon who specialized in the second coming and once or twice a week he taught the church about these things so for 13 years i i heard about these things on a weekly basis i studied it out myself since then i've heard a lot of people speak about it as have you romans 11 11 and 12 this is talking about the jewish people he said uh in fact, he is uh, quoting from Isaiah and uh, from Psalms, Deuteronomy, all of these Old Testament passages that speak about what happens when you lose the fear of the Lord. You become spiritually blind, your ears stop hearing these things. And then he's, Paul says, I say then, did they, the Jewish people, the Jewish people did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But if by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will, th will their fulfillment be? Apostle Paul is telling us that before Christ returns, the church, the Gentile church, is going to make the Jewish nation jealous about Messiah, and they're going to return to Messiah. Now, have you ever heard anybody say that this is going to happen before Jesus comes back? I haven't. The Bible says it. See, the commandments, they make conflict with what is wild, widely believed. And Apostle Paul tells us that when the, when the Jews stumbled, that made salvation come to the Gentiles but when they return, something better is even going to happen. So if we're going to be men and women who understand the times, then we have to understand. Now, it sounds like a contradiction. Some of these things are going to seem familiar to you. It's probably not going to surprise you. That there's two kinds of understanding. Now, 
There is understanding that comes from God. It is a fruit of the year of fear of the Lord. It is part of the seven gifts that are implied in salvation with the giving of the Holy Spirit. You'll remember wisdom and understanding are the two parts that do with our that have to do with our intellectual life once we've been born into the kingdom of God. It has to do with the transformed mind, God working to transform. Or the renewed mind, or as we've seen, the mind of Christ. This is one kind of understanding. Now remember, yet up here the Lord speaks about relationship. Do you have a relationship with God or not? Understanding. There, the second kind of understanding comes from Satan. It comes from having a relationship with Satan. It is an earthly, natural, demonic understanding. It is the pervasive understanding in cultural Christianity and cultural Jewishness. The Holy Spirit gives it to us when we're born into the kingdom of God. The understanding that comes from God, the yena, fear of the Lord. Remember, there's seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom and understanding is the first pair of those gifts that, that has to do with our intellectual life. The relationship with Satan began with the first sin in the garden. It continues today. It is the only form of understanding in the world. It is the dominant form of understanding in cultural Christianity. This is a hard lesson to learn. It's a hard lesson to hear. I don't want you to stumble or choke on this lesson, but it is important that we understand. Hebrews chapter 6. Now, this is a place where a lot of people get mixed up. It's going to be like a test. So, we're just going to look at the first three verses. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, or instruction about washing and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Okay, so he gives us a, a list of about eight things, and he lists them in order. The basic elementary teachings about Christ, pressing on to maturity, repentance of dead works. So if we had a test tonight on what is the repentance of dead works, how prepared are you to, to take and pass that test? Probably not very. 
Uh, me and Ms. Mitchell have had to study that. But uh, the average church member has no clue. Faith towards God, teachings about washings, these other things. So our classes from last semester, this semester, where do you think we are on this list? Nope. We're on the elementary teachings about Christ. The fear of the Lord is the, the beginning. So actually, we're at the very, very beginning. Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What is the beginning of wisdom? It's the first in line the first in time, and the first in a series. It means the first must be the first. Some of you will remember that the fear of the Lord is the ABCs of, of the Bible. When you're first starting to read, you have to learn the ABCs. Then you learn how those little ABCs get mixed, get put together in words, Bob. Mom, dad, run, hop. And then you put those little words together and you learn to read. When do we stop using the ABCs? We use them all of our life. From the small little words to the biggest words. First in time means it's the first. All biblical truth can only be understood in the fear of the Lord. And it is the first in the series. It has to be first. Now we just finished up with the world series. Let's imagine it's the seventh game of the World Series. It's tied. It's the bottom of the ninth. The bases are loaded, two outs. A guy comes up for your team. He hits a home run. It's a grand slam. They're going to win the game. He's jumping up and down. Everybody's jumping up and down. They're by, they were behind two runs. Now he's hit a grand slam. They're going to win by two. But in his excitement, he doesn't touch first base. He runs around all the other bases. He put the ball way out in the center field. What is he when he reaches home? He's out. He didn't touch first base. None of the runs count. They lose. First in line, first in time central to everything. Now, we're going to think about cultural Christianity and cultural Jewishness. John chapter 5, verse 37 through 42. John chapter 5, verse 37 through 42. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. We know without any doubt that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were the descendants of Moses, God's chosen people. But for many, many years, they had let the world creep into their religion. The book of Malachi, God speaking to people who have lost the fear of the Lord. We've gone over all of that. In verse 37, we read, And the Father who sent me he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. He is talking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious people of his day. He said, you have neither heard his voice 
nor seen his form, you do not have his word abiding in you. For you do not believe him whom he sent. Verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Okay. Do you see the cultural Jewish understanding prevents them from seeing and hearing? Culturally, they're Jews. By birth, they can trace their descendants back to Moses. They searched the scriptures. They were masters of the scriptures memorizing the first five books of the Bible, searching the scriptures diligently. But what understanding did they use when they searched the scriptures? Did they know Christ? Well, he says, no. Did they know God? Jesus says, you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding you in you, even though they diligently searched the scriptures. They never understood. They were unwilling to come to Christ. And he says, Moses accuses you. He says, you think in them you have eternal life. They had read, just as we have read, Proverbs 14, 27. Uh, they had the privilege of reading it in Hebrew. We have to read it in English, where in Hebrew it clearly says, the Yira, fear of the Lord, is a fountain of life. Yira is a relationship. Life comes from God. They had earthly, natural, demonic wisdom. They thought life came from the scriptures. The Jews, now, now, we're, now we're gonna get down to the meat of the lesson here right now. The Jews missed the first coming of Messiah because they did not understand the scriptures. The Jews missed the first coming because they did not understand the scriptures. They knew the scriptures. They didn't understand them. And I'm going to show you the difference. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the Arete, from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. But not just the king was troubled, all Jerusalem was troubled with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. 
they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then secretly, then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. Yet he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. So we have this event. These men from the east, they've arrived in Jerusalem. They come bearing news that where is the king of the Jews? We've seen his star. Herod is troubled. The whole city is troubled. Herod brings together all the chief priests and scribes, and he says, where is Messiah going to be born? Do they know the right answer? Really? He's going to be born in Bethlehem. They searched the scriptures. They knew. When did the star appear? Herod believed enough that he had all the babies born, that all the male babies killed. How many of the Pharisees and Sadducees our other Jewish leaders went to Bethlehem to see if there was a Messiah born. None. The only Jewish people that came to the birth was some shepherds. How can they have missed the first coming? They knew the scriptures. John chapter 8. They knew the scriptures, but they didn't understand them. John chapter 8, starting in verse 41. Remember, understanding comes from relationship. Relationship with God, the gift of fear of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, the transforming our mind, or we have the earthly, natural, demonic understanding that comes from a relationship with God. Satan, John 8, 41. What does Jesus say to the Pharisees and Sadducees? He said, and to the cultural Jewish religion, not the way God intended it to be, but the way it became when they brought in all this culture into their religion. He tells them very plainly, you are doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I've not even come on my own initiative, but he who sent me. Why do you not understand why I, what I am saying? Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. They searched the scriptures. They knew the right questions to prophecy questions. Where will Messiah be born? They were unwilling to take the trouble to go from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to see for themselves 
unwilling to come to Christ, unwilling to investigate to see if Christ had been born because they had earthly, natural, demonic understanding of Christianity. Again, Christianity must change the culture, not the culture change Christianity. We have the good example here of how the culture destroyed the Jewish religion. Now then, Matthew 16, 1 through 12, Again, the Pharisees and Sadducees come. And they're asking Jesus for a sign. This is a very important scripture. It directly relates to what we're studying about becoming men and women who understand the times. The Pharisees and Sadducees came up and testing Jesus they asked him to show them a sign from heaven, but he replied to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? Let's go back and read that again. They knew how to discern the appearance of the sky. They knew how to predict the weather, but they could not discern the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given, except the sign of Jonah, and he left them and went away. And the disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They began to discuss this among themselves, saying, He said that because we did not bring any bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets full you picked up? are the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you picked up. How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Now, in Matthew 15, we talked about this, I think, last semester. The disciples participated in they took part in, active role in the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. And they collected all of the food that was left over after feeding all of these people. But yet, when Jesus began to talk to them about this, trying to teach them something really important, they still didn't understand yet. Verse 9. Verse 8, he says to them, you men of little faith. Verse 9, do you not yet understand or remember? Verse 11, how is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? It's hard. It's hard for the disciples to make the break between the satanic, earthly, natural, demonic understanding and the understanding that comes from God. But it is vitally important that they understand these things because in just a few, just in a short time, the fate of the nation is going to hang in the balance. John chapter 12. They missed the first coming. 
in John chapter 12, starting in verse 12. We call this Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He's coming as their king. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as it is written in God's word, as it is written, a prophecy concerning Christ. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a don donkey's colt. Even though they searched the scriptures, they knew the scriptures, they knew that scripture, they knew that prophecy. These things his disciples did not understand at, the, at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. Luke 24. Yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm sorry, Luke 19, 41. I got it, got it out of order. Talking about the triumphal entry. <clears throat> So the Pharisees and Sadducees are upset that the crowd is crying out. In ver, uh, verse 39, that some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Because not only was he on a cult, but the people were crawling, crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is also a prophecy. And the Pharisees, knowing this was a prophecy, said, teacher, tell him to be quiet. Verse 40, Jesus answered, I, will, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now, they have been hidden from your eyes. For the day will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. They knew the scriptures. They knew the prophecy. But they did not understand. Now, Jesus is, when he's weeping over the city, he says, if you had known in this day, let's go back to Luke 13, 34 and 35, because this is what Jesus is referring to at this moment when he's weeping. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They understood scriptures. They could quote to you when Jesus, where Jesus will be born. They 
could quote to you the scripture about he's going to come on a colt, a donkey's colt. They can quote to you the prophecy that says that this is what the people are going to say. But they did not understand the times. What was Jesus's desire? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. For you would not have it. We lived in St. Kitts for six years and a hurricane came through. Uh, had winds over 125 miles an hour for over 24 hours. We had what we call yard chickens. They just ran around in the yard. We didn't have a place for them. We fed them a little bit. Had two hens that had just had large batches of chicks. The storm's coming. The chickens were wild. They wouldn't let us put them up. But as the wind began to blow, the mother hens made a sound and all her little babies came. And she lifted up her wings and they all got under her wings and she sat down on them. And the winds came, the rain, you just can't imagine the rain and the wind. I'd look out in the backyard and those little he that those two little hens were just so bedraggled and they looked drowned even though they were on dry land. And they sat there through the whole storm. When the storm ended, they stood up and under each one was 12, 15 little chicks, dry as a bone. Moms drowned, but they were dry as a bone. They went out looking for stuff to eat. Jesus says to the people, Jerusalem, there's a storm coming. And I want to protect you. You search the scriptures. You know the scriptures. You don't know me. You won't come to me. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. As a result, result of you rejecting your Messiah, your city is going to be totally destroyed. Luke 24, 31. We looked at this several times recently. Luke 24 is on the, happened after the crucifixion, but before the resurrection, or at the time of the resurrection, not everybody knows about the resurrection yet. Some of them, some of the disciples were going to Emmaus. They meet this man, they start talking to him. And he says, what's been going on? And they say, are you the only one that doesn't know? And we hoped this was the Messiah, but he was killed. And in verse 25, Jesus says to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter in his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And as they approached the village where they were going and acted as though they were, he acted as though they were going farther. He asked, they asked him to come in and he came in and he ate with them. Verse 31. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. He took the very scriptures that they already had studied all their lives, but he explained it to them and he opened their eyes. And then in verse 45, he comes back. Verse 44 and 45, he said to them, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all the things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the law of prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds 
to understand the scriptures. Took him a long time. But in the end, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now for us, it's a little easier because when we're born into the kingdom of God, now we receive the spirit of Christ. It's yet a fear of the Lord and all of the seven gifts that are implied. So we have an advantage in, in that sense. But the satanic understanding, this earthly, natural, demonic understanding that dominated their cultural Jewish religion was hard for them to break. This satanic, earthly, natural, demonic understanding that dominates and controls cultural Christianity is hard to break. Every single one of us is a victim of this cultural Christianity. All the prophecies of the birth of Messiah, the cross, the resurrection, I mean, the Old Testament is very, very specific. It tells us exactly the words that Messiah will say as he's hung on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Prophecy from the Old Testament. Jesus will be crucified with thieves. He will be buried in a rich man's tomb. The fact that the soldiers will cast lots for his clothes. All of these things in very specific detail were in the scriptures that, that they searched. Him rising on the third day. These disciples on the road to Emmaus under, knew that something had happened. But they didn't understand or know what. Verse 25, we've just read it, but let's read it again. 20, chapter 24 of Luke, verse 25. What does Jesus say to them? He said to them, O foolish men. Foolish is the opposite of what? Godly wisdom. Foolish, slow of heart to believe. Verse 26 and 27. He opened to them the very same scriptures that the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Jewish religion had searched and examined for many, 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 many generations. But they couldn't see nor understand, so he opened their eyes. Verse 32, they say, were not our hearts burning within us? While he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us, our hearts burning, that's the Holy Spirit working in them. And then finally, he opened their minds. We're trying to become men and women who understand the times. One of the hardest things we have to learn to understand we have to recognize how cultural Christianity is opposed to real biblical truth and real biblical understanding. Cultural Christianity is one of the largest stumbling blocks that keep people from coming to Christ. Number two. We have these clear examples of how the Pharisees and Sadducees, who knew the scriptures, missed the birth of Christ. They missed their chance to repent and return to God. They missed their chance to welcome Messiah coming to Jerusalem. They missed out on the crucifixion and resurrection we have to learn from their mistakes. When we're thinking about the second coming, 
we have to learn and know and understand that the examples before us, they missed the easy things. So we have to start at the beginning with the fear of the Lord. We have to understand what Satan stole. We've had a couple of lessons about that. We, we have to understand how God restores. We have to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. We have to have renewed minds and transformed minds. Now, unfortunately, most, I would say almost all, of the teaching on the second coming of Christ is done by those who do not themselves know the terror of the Lord. They, it is done by those who do not feed God's people with knowledge and understanding. We've talked about that in the previous weeks. And they leave out one very important part from Romans 11, 11 and 12, because the church has not yet, never from the time of the book of Acts until the day made the Jews jealous. And by their transgression, the Jewish transgression, their stumbling, the riches of salvation came to us. They were supposed to take God's riches of salvation to the world. Think about when Jonah went to Nineveh and Nineveh repented. But they didn't. They rejected God. They took the cultural Jewish religion, made a God of their own making. But the Bible tells us when they are made jealous, that's in the future, when they are made jealous and return to Messiah, even greater riches will come upon the world. If we're going to be men and women who understand the times, we have to learn how in a practical way to use the wisdom and understanding that comes from God to destroy the earthly, natural, demonic with understanding, the earthly, natural, demonic wisdom so that the true chief teachings about Christ change the culture. Change the whole world rather than bringing culture and the world into the church. Okay, any questions? There's a question for Paul. Okay. People ask me, why don't I teach on the second coming? Okay, just a second. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, are we to understand that uh, the end times, we can understand the end times better with uh, through uh, commandments, culture, and conviction? Well, we can understand the end times only through the understanding that comes from God because of our relationship with God through the gifts of the Holy Spirit as he gives us a transformed mind. The culture and conviction are things that should never be taught of, taught in the church. I mean, we can speak about them privately, but we cannot preach about them because they change. When we preach and teach, we should be speaking about the unchanging things of God, an unchanging word of God. Things that we can speak about with confidence and assurance that this is not man's words, it's God. 
And plus, I don't think we need to preach something that is not certain in the Bible. It's, it's something that we can assume or we can incline to, but not uh, but uh, if we if something in the Bible is not certain or we can't prove even if it's certain, but we can prove so, through scriptures not only end of times but any topic. I think any topic. We we should pre we shouldn't preach until we certain that we can prove from the scripture that this is the doctrine and this doctrine is correct. I okay. think. Now tonight's lesson I specifically addressed understanding and the as it relates to the second coming, right? We could have had the same lesson to speak about what the Bible says about salvation as opposed to what cultural Christianity says about salvation because they're two very different things. We could have taught the same lesson using the example of worship. or the work of the Holy Spirit. We had somebody ask about how the fear of God applies to the second coming, so that's why we did it. And to me, it's very clear because you can see how the Jewish people messed up the first coming, the, the birth, the triumphant entry, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah. Those are easy for us to understand because we're on the other side of it. But cultural Christianity and the satanic, earthly, natural, demonic wisdom and understanding affect all of these and others in, the, in churches today. And if we're going to become men and women who understand the times, we have to learn how to see and recognize where the world has come into the church. Okay, and how the world even has entered into the teaching of the second coming. Okay. Recently, I was asked by a man, why don't I teach about the second coming? And I said, well, I myself am ready for the Lord's return, but I have a lot of friends and people that I love that are not ready. And I would rather teach and preach on the things that, that, have, that have an effect on them and trying to help them to become ready. I'm working on the first things. That's what I'm working on, okay? Any other questions? <clears throat> 